Welcome to the 61st Annual Beverly Hills Bar Association Supreme Court Luncheon. As you can see, we are starting on time in order to conclude on time, as the court has requested due to its afternoon calendar that we finish before 1.15 p.m. And I'm going to ask you and remind you at the end if you would please remain seated until all the justices have exited the room before getting up from your seats. Welcome. I am Linda Spiegel, president of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, and it is my extreme honor and distinguished privilege to welcome you this afternoon. I'd like to introduce our dais. Beginning at my far left to your right, Council Member William Bryan, City of Beverly Hills, Mr. Doron Egbali, President of the Barristers, Ms. Gillian Brown, President of the Beverly Hills Bar Association Foundation, Mark R. Steinberg, our Executive Director, Chief Executive Director. <laughs> and beginning at my far right, your left, Mr. Ronald L. Brown, Los Angeles County Public Defender. Mr. Jim McDonald, if you could hold your applause, please, thank you. Mr. Jim McDonald, Los Angeles County Sheriff. Justice Marvin R. Baxter, retiring. <laughs> and Mr. Frederick M. Nicholas. And our Chief Justice, Tani G. Cantil Sakauye. Again, I'm going to ask you to hold your applause till the end. I'm also going to introduce our president-elect, Howard Fredman, our vice president, Howard Fisher, second vice president, Richard Kaplan, secretary treasurer, LaVon Lawson, barrister's president, Daron Bali, barrister's president-elect, William Wenzel, and immediate past president, Diane Karpman. I only have three more sets of introductions. <laughs> Our past presidents, Nicholas R. Alice, Christopher T. Bradford, Dixon Q. Dern, Diane Cartman, Nancy Knupfer, Daniel McIntosh, Cynthia Pasternak, Kenneth G. Petrulis, Mark Poster, John Rubiner, Mark Steinberg, Michael H. White. and our judges. In a couple of minutes, our Chief Justice will introduce her colleagues on the California Supreme Court to you. But at this time, it is my pleasure and honor on behalf of the Beverly Hills Bar Association to welcome currently sitting judicial officers to our luncheon this year. I would appreciate it if the judges of the U.S. District Court, U.S. Court of Appeals, and other federal judicial officers would kindly stand and be recognized at this time. And now I would appreciate it if the justices of the California Courts of Appeals, judges of the Superior Courts, and other state judicial officers would stand and be recognized. <laughs> Final set of introductions. Please join me in welcoming the law school deans of our scholarship award recipients here today. Vice Dean Catherine Carpenter, Southwestern Law School, Dean Rachel F. Moran, UCLA Law School, Dean Robert Rasmussen, USC Law School, Senior Assist Associate Dean Sean Scott, Loyola University School of Law, and Dean Dean Reese Taha, Pepperdine School of Law. And now a word about our sponsors. We sincerely appreciate the following affinity partners and member benefit providers without whom this event would not be possible for their support now and continuing through the year. Elkins Jones Insurance Agency, 
LexisNexis, Matloff Life, Health and Disability Insurance. And finally, and almost most importantly, our gratitude to the most dedicated Bar Association staff on the planet. They make this event look like a piece of cake when in reality, they put in tireless hours and endless weeks to make every detail perfection. Thank you to our staff. We are pleased to have Beverly Hills City Council Member Dr. Willie Bryan with us today. Council Member Dr. Willie Bryan is the former Chief of Staff of Cedar sinai Medical Hospital and currently the Executive Vice Chairman of the Department of Surgery and Chairman of the Department of Orthopedics. But most importantly, he's the grandson of Earl Warren, former Governor of California and Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. Please join me in warmly, warmly welcoming Council Member William Bryan. Thank you very much, uh, President Spiegel. And on behalf of the City of Beverly Hills, I'd like to welcome the honorable members of the California Supreme Court, leaders from our local law firms and law schools, and scholarship recipients to Beverly Hills and the 61st Supreme Court Luncheon. I'd also like to say to the uh, future lawyers in this room, um, one person that I want to call out just momentarily uh, when you look at public service and giving back is the great city attorney uh, from the city of Los Angeles, Mike Schur, who's here with us today. And I want to offer my warm congratulations to the future lawyers on your academic success. Although I chose a career in medicine, there are many lawyers in my family, starting with my grandfather, my uncle, two cousins, all of whom have served on the bench, and now I'm proudly the father of two lawyers. So I do have a special interest in the kind of lawyers that we turned out each year. I urge you to hold on to your youthful idealism and on your commitment to justice throughout your career. These state Supreme Court justices sitting here today are shining examples of where that can lead for you. Chief Justice Earl Warren said, it is the spirit and not the form of law that keeps justice alive. As attorneys, you have a special obligation to serve the community more than any other profession. You have the knowledge and skills to help those in society who have neither. Use your skills and your knowledge and the spirit of the law to protect the interests of the most vulnerable in our society. There are opportunities to serve right here in Beverly Hills. The Beverly Hills Bar Association and the Beverly Hills Bar Foundation provide legal services, outreach programs, scholarships, and the Public Council Law Center. As a city, we are deeply appreciative and need the help from our partners such as the Bar Foundation to help us provide essential services to our seniors and our residents. So that's enough for my lecture today. Again, congratulations, good luck, and thank you all for the opportunity to speak here today. Thank you, Councilman uh, Brian. We look forward to a good working relationship with the city going forward for providing services for the community. The Beverly Hills Bar Foundation is the charitable arm of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. And among other very worthwhile projects, it provides scholarships to law students. It is now my pleasure to introduce the president of the Beverly Hills Bar Foundation, Gillian Brown, a partner at Pachulski Stang, Zeal and Jones, LLP. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to keep this quick so you can keep on eating. Uh, I want to welcome everybody, the court in particular, um, and each and every one of you who made it out today. This is a signature event and sort of the, the highlight of our year when we get to honor the court and also thank all of you for being part of the works that we do. And probably most importantly, uh, our opportunity to introduce to you our scholarship winners and the rule of law students. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the prior uh, presidents of the Beverly Hills Bar Foundation, all of whom I believe will be here. And if you could just raise your hand. Nick Alice, 
Don Colson, Stephen Gardner, Bonnie Moore, Ken Petrulis, Uzi Renan, and Geraldine Weil. Thank you all for your service. This year, the following firms are scholarship donors, which mean that their names are inscribed on each of the scholarship certificates that we're going to give later on today. Um, and I'd like the people at the firm tables to raise their hands so we can all take a look um, and gaze your way. Gerardi Keys, Greenis Martin Stein and Richmond, uh, Richland LLP, Law Offices of Lisa L. Maki, Chernoff Bidart Echeverria Bentley LLP, the USC Gould School of Law, Beverly Hills Bar Association Institute on Entertainment Law and Business. Also, we'd like to thank the Champions of Justice donors who contributed at a uh, level of $4,000 per table. Bird, Morella, Boxer, Wolpert, Nessum, Drooks, Linsenberg, and Rao PC. Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher, LLP, Greenberg Glusker, Greenberg Traurig, Manat, Phelps and Phillips, LLP, Pacholsky, Stang, Zeal and Jones, LLP, Robbins, Kaplan, LLP, and Valencia Rose, PLC. We have a, a rule of law competition. It was a writing competition, and law students, you'll meet them in a little while, uh, competed for uh, recognition. And that, that scholarship is uh, underwritten by Goodson, Wachtel, and Petrulis APC. We'd like to thank Marshall Grossman and Ora Carrington and Sutcliffe LLP for their special contribution. We have three press reception co-sponsors who we'd also like to thank. Aiken Gum, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld, LLP, East Debt Litigation Technology, over there, and Tory Pines Bank. And finally, thank you to everybody who responded to our appeals for fundraising for our scholarships, uh, and, and particularly those who um, responded to our crowd, crowd fund sourcing appeal, which is a new embrace of technology that we're just starting to implement. We are pleased today to continue a tradition of having past Bar Association and Bar Foundation scholarship recipients return here to speak about how their scholarship assisted them in law school and how they have gone on to success in their law career. And so today we will be introducing and hearing from one of those recipients, Ronald Brown, the Los Angeles County Public Defender. No relation. Ronald Brown was appointed the LA County Public Defender in 2011. He has more than 30 years of experience with the Public Defender's Office, which represents indigent defendants, including juvenile offenders who cannot pay for private counsel. As an assistant public defender, Mr. Brown supervised adult operations, managing 10 branch offices, 26 area offices, and about 400 attorneys and more than 100 investigators and administrative staff. One of the first challenges he faced when he took on his new position was million dollar budget cuts and how to effectively and creatively make significant changes to keep the public defender's office running efficiently. Mr. Brown was born in Utah to a family of 10 children. He earned his undergraduate degree from the University of Southern California and his law degree from UCLA. Please join me in welcoming Ronald Brown. Good afternoon, everyone. I was told to keep this brief, and so I will. The two catchphrases are, that you'll hear in the courtroom a lot are brevity, and sometimes you'll hear the phrase return on investment. And I can be brief, but I really want to talk to you about the return on investment that the Beverly Hills Bar Association did with me. Uh, one of the things that some people do that I try to avoid doing is the self-important, you know, we were so poor stories, but it really is true. Uh, I was raised in South Central Los Angeles, although I was born in Utah. I uh, went to school in Compton and the Watts area, lived in public housing projects. I'm not saying that to embellish anything, but I'm giving you that brief history to let you know how I was over, able to overcome a lot of things with the help of the help Beverly Hills Bar Association. 
but for that scholarship, I would have had to continue to work violating Dean Moran's rules about first year students working, second year students working, and so forth. But with the help of that scholarship, I actually graduated from the, one of the finest law schools in the nation, the UCLA School of Law. The return on investment that you guys are seeing here is that I now lead the largest criminal defense firm in this country. We now have over 700 trial lawyers. We now have over 1,200 employees. And I have been there now 34 and a half years. It is the greatest job I've ever had, and I wouldn't be there but for the help of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. It's, they do valuable work, and I continue to believe that I wouldn't be successful or even be here without them. I want to thank the Supreme Court for being here. I want to thank the Beverly Hills Bar Association, and I'm hoping that I kept this within the three minutes that I was given because I didn't time this. <laughs> so thank you all very much for coming, and thanks to Beverly Hills Bar Association. I wish to thank the scholarship, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Supreme Court Lunch Donor Committee Chairs, Jerry Weil and John Colson, and the members of that committee, Benita Moore, Mark Poster, Darren Schlechter, Bruce Sires, Danielle, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Stephen Young, Diana of Sepian, Elizabeth Peterson, Mark Steinberg, and Ann Simley. I also wish to thank the scholarship section committee chair, Darren Schlechter, and his committee, which was composed of Bob Aronoff, Mark Poster, Linda Blank, Danielle Grabois, Joseph Heckmott, Bonita Moore, Jaron Bali, Jill Levin, Judith Dornstein, and LaVon Lawson. And finally, thank you to the Rule of Law Committee and its chair, Ken Petrulis. Ken's committee members were Mark Poster, Bonita Moore, Don Colson, Darren Schlechter, and Matthew Kanan. Now, the class of 2015 Beverly Hills Bar Foundation scholarship recipients not only are academically qualified and have financial need, you all know what the cost of a law school education is these days, but more importantly, each of them has demonstrated a commitment to community service. Our scholarship committee interviewed 22 outstanding students who were called from a much larger group. All of those interviewed have done extraordinary community service and public interest work and were deserving and could have benefited from a scholarship from the Beverly Hills Bar Foundation. Our limited funds, alas, dictate that we narrowed the field to five recipients, one from each of our local law schools, and we honor them very proudly today. So on behalf on the, of the Beverly Hills Bar Foundation, it is my pleasure and genuine delight to present the 2015 Law School Scholarship recipients and the winners of the sixth annual Rule of Law Writing Competition. But rather than me telling you about them, we will let them introduce themselves to you with our first ever video presentation. My name is Mark Swenson. I go to the University of Southern California Gould School of Law. Hi, my name is Maritza Agundes, and I am currently attending Southwestern Law School. I'm Nora Lapopolo. Um, I am a recent graduate of Pepperdine Law School, and I am also a graduate of Boston College. Hi, I'm Emmy Aceves. I am currently a second year law student at Loyola Law, and afterwards I went to the University of Southern California and got my master's in social work. Well, my name is Corral Lopez. I went to undergraduate school at the University of Florida, and I am at UCI School of Law. My name is Pauline Shen, and I will be a 3L at Pepperdine School of Law. Uh, as a social worker, before coming to law school, I still felt that I wanted to make bigger societal changes in a lot of the injustices that I was coming across working with my clients, and I felt that law school would really help me um, achieve that in a more comprehensive manner than simply um, using my social work skills. 
So my undergraduate school, Boston College, was a Jesuit institution, and uh, the Jesuit motto of education is men and women for others. Um, and so that's something that really became important for me in undergrad was public service. And um, so I always knew that I wanted to do something public service oriented. And I'd also always loved, I was on debate in undergrad and um, loved writing, liked arguing, liked public speaking. And so I decided to go to law school. I attended law school because I grew up in affordable housing and growing up in the Harbor City Projects um, inspired me to look forward to changing affordable housing policy in California and specifically in Los Angeles. I come from a family that is strongly public interest oriented. My mother is a school teacher and my father is a police officer. So I knew that I wanted to go into some field where I could help people and it seemed like the best opportunity for me was law school where I can either work as a DA advocating for victims or work as a public defender advocating for those who don't have the means to defend themselves. I graduated with pro bono honors, which is 200 hours of service um, just from extra pro bono service. And honestly, to me, it was never like a chore or anything. It was just something that I felt like I needed to do to keep my sanity during law school and to be able to remind me of why, why I was here and what, why we do what we do. I learned from an early age, uh, probably high school, that I was really passionate about social justice work. Uh, I come from a family of immigrants and we experience a lot of uh, injustices and barriers uh, just adjusting to life in America and so that made me really aware of um, wanting to help others so that they didn't have to go through what we experienced. I was a part of the Pepperdine's Arrest Rights Workshop where we go to multiple runaway homes and teach youth um, adolescents their rights uh, when they do get arrested. My second biggest achievement I believe is I worked with Prison of Peace to help women uh, inmates in Los Angeles County to teach them mediation peace, uh, peacemaking skills. I have definitely enjoyed much of my time working within my own community. Um, I currently am working at the District Attorney's Office at the Compton Superior Court Branch and previously I was working with Community Legal Services providing help and aid to domestic violence victims. Well I was really engaged with the domestic violence declarations. Um, on Fridays we would go over to the uh, family law court in Santa Ana and I would be able to help Spanish-speaking victims of domestic violence to file their domestic violence declarations um, before they went into the judge to get a temporary restraining order. Um, and it was, so, it was so great because you could get there at 9 a.m. and by noon you would see the fruits of your labor. That's a good question. Um, I want to hopefully find work at an amazing nonprofit and continuing doing work for social justice. I would like to pursue an opportunity at the district attorney's office so I can advocate for victims and ensure that people are brought to justice and our communities are safer. In 10 years, hopefully, I will have set a foundation regarding legislation and policy work surrounding housing policy and possibly have been appointed to either a government agency moving forward with providing and finding funding for affordable housing in Los Angeles and or uh, running for office uh, locally in the city of Compton. I actually want to be a public defender. Um, in LA County because I believe that just because you are labeled as a criminal that you shouldn't always be labeled that and they can find their identity in something else, something better, and that everyone deserves second chances. When I was a 2L, I um, took Dean Taha's Rule of Law seminar. It, it ended up being by far my favorite class in law school. Um, it was so interesting. There were only about 10 of us in the class, and so it really was discussion-based, and we got to hear a lot about um, Dean Taha's experience in Rule of Law, and it was also co-taught by um, Justice Alan Linden, who was on the Canadian Supreme Court, and who also had a lot of really interesting things to say about Rule of Law. 
paper that I wrote for the Rule of Law competition was entitled, Three Can Keep a Secret If Two of Them Are the NSA and FISA Court, National Security and the Rule of Law. Uh, it was a tremendous honor being nominated for this scholarship by my dean and an even greater honor to be selected. I'm extremely humbled and honored. It means more than I can put into words. It's very, it's going to very help me towards um, my goals and dreams of becoming a public defender and helping people, all the people that deserve second chances. And I'm so grateful and so honored to be the grand prize winner of the Beverly Hill Bar Association Bar Foundation Rule of Law Writing Competition. Thank you for focusing on students and the help that we need. Um, and thank you for all your support. We congratulate the scholarship recipients and award winners and ask you to stand and remain standing as I call your name. Emmy Aceves of Loyola Law School, Los Angeles. Maritza Agundes of Southwestern Law School. Han Lu of UCLA School of Law, Pauline Shin of Pepperdine University School of Law, Mark Swenson of USC Gould School of Law. We give a little round of applause for our scholarship. And now I'm going to announce the rule of law winners. The grand prize winner of the Rule of Law Writing Competition for 2015 is Nora Lopopolo of Pepperdine University School of Law. And Nora, stand if you would, and we will uh, also announce the honorable mention winners who can stand as well. Daniel A. Caden of Southwestern Law School and Corral Del Mar Lopez Rosario of the University of California, Irvine School of Law. The scholarship and uh, winner certificates will be presented by the scholarship committee chair, Darren Schlechter, and rule of law chair, Ken Petrulis, at the conclusion of our luncheon. I have been asked by the Beverly Hills Bar Association Board of Governors to inform each of these law students that they will also receive a complimentary membership for the year to the Beverly Hills Bar Association. Thank you, Gillian, and thank you to the foundation <clears throat> and to the award recipients you inspire us. We have been in practice many years, those of us who are uh, in practice and here today, and you inspire us and remind us of what it means to want to do good for others. Remember that the Beverly Hills Bar Association has pro bono opportunities. Remember us and come back to us and we, will, we have lots of opportunities to do pro bono work for the community and we welcome your participation and continue to inspire us and do good and come back like Ron Brown and, and uh, let us know how well you did. And now, on behalf of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, I have the great honor to present the Special Recognition Award to former Associate Justice Marvin Baxter for his outstanding leadership during his 24 years of service on the California Supreme Court. During his tenure on the court, Justice Baxter, a California native, addressed many cutting edge issues of social policy, including the degree of legal protection for Good Samaritans, damages for exposure to toxic chemicals, and same-sex marriage. Having just retired from the California Supreme Court, Justice Baxter is enjoying his renewed focus on collecting vintage automobiles, and we wish him all the best. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Justice Marvin Baxter.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very, very, very much for that kind welcome. And thank you, Linda, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Actually, uh, uh, we were in the process, uh, we are in the process of restoring a 1919 Chevrolet Baby Grand touring car in Fresno. And I was very tempted to drive it up, up <laughs> down here to Los Angeles, but I uh, wasn't quite certain it would uh, uh, handle the uh, grapevine. <laughs> I want to thank the uh, Beverly Hills Bar Association uh, for this award. It's a very meaningful award coming from an organization that has done so much uh, for the uh, judicial branch. And uh, I've been in a position during my 24 years on the court to witness uh, the leadership that the Beverly Hills Bar has taken uh, in uh, advocating for the independence of the judiciary day in and day out, which of course also includes uh, adequate funding for the courts. And I do want to commend the uh, association and the foundation for uh, this event uh, dedicated to providing scholarships for our future generation of lawyers. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing and, and of course Ron Brown's a testament to the benefit that, uh, that will result from that uh, assistance. I'm going to keep things short. I've had the privilege to serve 32 consecutive years in public service, including uh, service as the governor's appointment secretary, uh, service on the Court of Appeal, and most importantly, the, ta the, the past 24 years on the Supreme Court. So now with retirement, a question I'm often asked is, now what are you going to do? And I'm going to enjoy life. But I'm going to miss, and I must say, I'm going to miss the relationships uh, that I've had with my colleagues uh, on the court, uh, current and uh, past. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to work together on issues, uh, contentious issues, issues you don't always uh, see eye to eye on, uh, in, in an effort to uh, result in a chorus, an opinion that reflects the, uh, the view of the court. Uh, I want to just tell one little story. Uh, and this story I told at Justice Mosk's uh, memorial service. And it reflects the type of camaraderie that we enjoyed on the court. I had a case. It was a tough case. And the case was argued, and uh, coming out of the post-argument conference, uh, the court was split three to three, and Moss was the swing. And he said, I'll have to think about it before I commit. So a couple days later, uh, Justice Moss came into my chambers and said, Marv, he says, I'll sign your, uh, I'll sign your opinion on one condition. And of course, I'm desperate. And I said, well, I'm trying to act like I'm not desperate, but, not, but I'm desperate. <laughs> and I said, well, what is it, Stanley? And he said, you know, in your concluding paragraph, you say that this conclusion is supported by common sense. <clears throat> he says, common sense has nothing to do with our judicial process. And <laughs> If you'll eliminate that opinion, that it's supported by common sense, I'll sign your opinion. Well, I didn't want to just accept that point blank, so I asked my research lawyer to check things out a little bit. And armed with that research, I went into Justice Mosk's chambers a few days later and said, uh, Stanley, I'll, I'll take you up on your deal, but I want you to know that I've found 32 cases where you've relied on common sense. <laughs> and, and you'd have to know Justice Moss, but he gave me this real sheepish grin. <laughs> and he said, but that was my common sense, <laughs> not yours. So anyway, that's just an example of the uh, 
type of relationship we have on the court, and I, and I have to say to both uh, Justice Cuellar and Justice Kruger, you're in for a great ride. Congratulations, and thank you very, very much. My name is Fred Nicholas, and uh, this is the 30th plus year that I've had the honor to introduce the Chief Justice of the State of California. And today, I'm honored to be able to introduce uh, Chief Justice for her fifth time at this luncheon. And uh, we're all very excited about having him having her here. Uh, Chief Justice Tani Cantil Sakahui, and I pronounced that well, I think, <laughs> was sworn into office as Chief Justice in California in 2011. So she's been here five times. And uh, she's the second woman to serve the state in that role, first being Rose Bird. And Rose Bird was the first person that I introduced at this, at this luncheon. So that's 38 years ago. Uh, when the chief took office, California was in a mess. It was in a grip of financial crisis, and the judicial branch was absorbing the largest single budget cut in its history. From her first months in office, the chief justice sounded the alarm about the impact of cutting costs and how it would affect the administration of justice. And she has worked tirelessly since that time to strengthen many of the court systems and processes. Chief Justice was born in Sacramento. Uh, she went to the University of California, had a BA degree in law school at University uh, Davis uh, at uh, Martin Luther King uh, School. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tani Kani Cantil Sakaoyu. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is indeed a pleasure to be here. It doesn't seem like my fifth time. Always the Beverly Hills Bar Association and Foundation, you are so gracious in hosting us. I thank you, Linda. I thank you, Jillian. I thank you, Mark, for all of the outreach you do with our court. Uh, it is an, also a pleasure to bring to your attention people you know very well, but it is my privilege to introduce to you the California Supreme Court, starting with Justice Kay Werdegar. <laughs> Justice Ming Chin and his wife, Carol. Justice Carol Corrigan. <laughs> Justice Goodwin Liu. <laughs> Justice Mariano Florentino Cuellar. <laughs> and Justice Leandra Kruger. I also would like to introduce very important people to our staff who are here today, and that is Frank McGuire, our Clerk of the Court. And my new principal attorney, Karen Fujisaki. I stole Karen Fujisaki from Justice Baxter's chamber, where she had served him dutifully and faithfully as a research attorney for 24 years. Wow. 
And I have to stop myself from introducing Justice Baxter and Jane as the eighth persons. But it is something that after my many years with uh, Marv and Jane, uh, still close in my heart, that I always feel when I see them to introduce them. So as Linda and Jillian spent a great deal of time thanking people for the work that went into not only this luncheon, but the support of the Bar Association and support of the five wonderful scholarships here today, I tell you about the work that we do in the judiciary, and it is with the good work of my colleagues from the Courts of Appeal who are here, my colleagues from the Superior Court, and many others, many of you here who've served either on Judicial Council or on the State Bar Board of Trustees, or on many of the advisory committees that work into creating the statewide policy and rules. It is the work of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, your members, that really have brought California forward. In my view, doing the hardest work in the last five years, where we not only faced the largest single budget cut, the Great Recession, but also a reorganization of the judicial branch and its administration in many, many ways due to those cuts. And so I thank the Beverly Hills Bar Association for your voice in the legislature, in the halls, to your members about the need for a fully funded judiciary, that we serve the same constituents, that you bring the rule of law to be tested to court, and in court is where we clarify that so that it can be used as a guidepost for all in the future. You really have been there, and I recognize so many of you, not only here, but at the ABA functions, for your statewide work and your national work. Let me also say that even though we are in our third year of budget restoration and that we are going in the right direction, in my view, as you know, we're not going fast enough or deep enough. But I am grateful for all of your voices in educating the legislature and the public about the need to fully fund the branch and the governor's efforts in every year providing more and more millions to restore or reinvest from the one and a half billion taken from the judiciary. I'm especially proud of the hard work of the the Court of Appeal justices and the Court of Appeal and the judges who have really worked to make that a reality to still bring due process and equal protection and efficiencies to the judiciary. And while this year we are getting a slight bump, a modest bump, we are grateful for that. But in addition, I'm proud to say that the legislature has recognized the need to fund dependency counsel and the crisis of overload in those kinds of cases where our most precious resource is in court about its future, and that's children. And three years ago in my blueprint for a fully funded judiciary, we asked for $33 million for a dependency council to ease the caseload and improve the prices, the costs, the salaries, the investigation. And I'm proud to say that the legislature has seized upon that figure and has included it in their bid to the governor for the June budget. Additionally, the legislature has seen that our collaborative courts, our problem-solving courts, which reduce recidivism and try to improve offender outcomes, have been successful. And they're looking at bringing to the judicial branch another one and a half million dollars to ensure that collaborative courts can continue to flourish in California, where California is a leader. But while we faced budget cuts and budget crises, and while we have fought mightily against that tide, I want to point out that the judicial branch, with your help, has not stayed still. We are dynamic, we're fluid, and I want to mention three things that we're working on, just three simple things we're working on now that I believe will bear fruit in the future. And the first is our civics initiative, which seeks to engage K through 12, where we've partnered with the superintendent of public instruction to teach about the third branch of government and also the legislative branch and the, and the executive branch, but to explain why it's so critical that a judicial branch be there as a check and balance, to explain to young leaders that civics is a path toward leadership. And I'm really proud that we have Dean Taha here, who sits on our steering committee, the power of democracy, who seeks to implement civics at a local level and a state level. I'm also very proud that Carol Corrigan has agreed to lead the Futures Commission, which is in full swing. Carol Corrigan, along with Justice McGinnis from the Court of Appeal First Appellate District, had an executive committee and approximately 63 other judges and lawyers and subject matter experts to try to take a look at what California's judicial system and legal system will need in the future. And what should we be doing now 
to prepare for that. And so we have a futures commission that is focusing on civil work, on criminal work, on traffic, on administration, to look at a new way that we can deliver services and where we can leverage our resources so that we look in the future to be prepared for any of the calamities that have faced us in the last five. I'm also proud to speak to you about our language access program. That is, California has the most comprehensive language access plan because over 200 languages are spoken in California. And I'm proud to say that Justice Tino Cuellar has taken on the lead in implementing the recommendations for the task force. And he's brought together a collaborative group of subject matter experts, interpreters, professors, judges and lawyers to talk about California, the most diverse and populous state in the country, and how we can lead for meaningful language access in our courts and in the ancillary services that people need connected to the courts. And so, though we have spent the last five years under the shadow of a budget reduction, and though that is still our first and foremost discussion with the legislature, we continue to be innovative, we continue to be transparent. California has the most open public judiciary, I believe, in, this, in the country. Uh, we have open records and open meetings for all of our policy advisory committee meetings. And we work to bringing our courts to the people. And it's through you that we're able to accomplish these things, even though we face many, many struggles. And I'd like to borrow a line from the SEALs who say the last easy day was yesterday. It's what we do. It's what you do. It's what these bright young scholarship winners will do. And I look forward to seeing that happen. And I thank you for all your support and for all of your graciousness. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. It's, it's wonderful to hear such good news and news of progress, and we look forward to hearing more of it. Our featured speaker today is Los Angeles County Sheriff Jim McDonnell. In December 2014, Jim McDonnell was sworn in as the 32nd Sheriff of Los Angeles County. Prior to that, he was Chief of Police of Long Beach. And preceding that, he served for 29 years at the Los Angeles Police Department, where he held every rank from police officer to second in command under Chief Bill Bratton. During his time at the LAPD, he earned that department's Medal of Valor and their highest honor of bravery. Sheriff McDonald is committed to ensuring that safe streets and neighborhoods enable all residents and businesses of Los Angeles' diverse county to thrive. Please welcome Sheriff Jim McDonald. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, President Spiegel. It's truly an honor to be here today addressing such an esteemed group and to be sharing the podium with real giants such as the Chief Justice, members of the California Supreme Court, retired Justice Marvin Baxter, and my partner, public defender Ron Brown. Thank you all. Justice Baxter, your decades of public service are an inspiration to all of us. You exemplify the best of what serving our community and our state and our nation is all about. My congratulations also to today's scholarship recipients. Your accomplishments are inspiring and impressive. And I was watching that video and I'm always looking for leads. And I noticed, <laughs> you probably saw that we were recruiting. I saw that of the candidates uh, for law school, our, uh, our future lawyers, none of them said down the road they want to be a deputy sheriff. And I was a little disappointed, but then I remembered that my own daughter just finished her first year at Georgetown Law School and she doesn't want to be a cop either. <laughs> but I appreciate the bar's invitation to share some perspectives with you today after just over six months on the job as your sheriff. And it's truly been a whirlwind uh, for the past half year I've traveled over all parts of this vast county. I've literally seen our terrain by highway, helicopter, sea, and this past weekend, even on horseback. And for a Boston kid, that was a painful experience. <laughs> but I've come to appreciate the rich, diverse, and multicultural county and landscape that all of us are privileged to call home. Some of you may have already surmised that I didn't grow up in Beverly Hills or the surrounding areas. My career in law enforcement began decades earlier. I came to Southern California almost 34 years ago 
the son of immigrants who grew up in a working class neighborhood in Boston, just down the street from Fenway Park. My apologies to all the Dodger fans in here. I came to LA with little more than a dream and a desire to protect and serve the community. So for the last three decades, I've been privileged to devote my life to the service of others, as most of, not all of you here share that. But I never, never would I or my immigrant parents have imagined that I'd be standing here today with such an esteemed group as the head of the larger sheriff's department in the United States. During my decades in local law enforcement here in Los Angeles, I worked closely with the men and women of the sheriff's department. I came to respect the dedication they bring to this complex and far too often dangerous job. And I also watched this department go through intensely difficult times. LASD is the largest sheriff's department and the second largest police agency in the United States. And I would argue the most complex law enforcement agency in the nation and maybe even the world. We're responsible for 18,000 sheriff's employees, 42 contract cities, 130 unincorporated areas, nine community colleges, 177 county parks, six major hospitals. The geography is over 4,500 square miles, population over 10 million people, 42 superior courts, the largest jail system in the nation, and we have a, a, about a $3.2 billion budget, which while it sounds like a lot, uh, is nowhere near what we really need to do the job. LASD is also an agency that's flown below the radar, and I intend to be able to change that. I've made clear to the department that we can and we will raise the bar high and be second to none. The residents of LA County are entitled to nothing less. While our responsibilities are vast, please know how much we value our work with and for each and every one of you. Partnerships with bar groups and community organizations matter greatly to me. All of you as lawyers and are partners in my efforts to help protect our community and to ensure a just and fair system of justice. You understand and appreciate the value of the rule of law, and I welcome your partnership as we seek to promote and protect these values that our nation appropriately holds so dear. So what have I been doing for the last, uh, for, at LASD over the last few months? Then I've been asked that a number of times. The first thing is to, as the sheriff is to be able to set the tone. I've made clear all of my staff from day one that I expect an uncompromising standard of professionalism, integrity, and courtesy in how we deal with our community on a daily basis. I've stressed that personal integrity in the service of constitutional policing must be the highest value of the LA County Sheriff's Department. And I've also made clear that this department will operate with transparency. We welcome our community's engagement and the watchful eye in holding us accountable. The second thing we've done is taken a hard look at our organization's structure. We've seen that some things were set up to accommodate crime structures and patterns of years past, rather than with emerging and current public safety concerns in mind. I'm also looking at making sure that we have the right people in the right places and that we operate effectively and efficiently. I don't intend to reorganize the department quickly. I see no value in acting just to act. And I'm taking time to learn the strengths of this department, where we can and should do better, and coming to know the over 18,000 people in this incredible organization. These are challenging times for those of us in law enforcement. But with these challenges come the critical need to remember that community policing must be the bedrock for all that we do. We must recognize that every interaction we have shapes the future, both of individuals and of our community. So at LASD, we've engaged in activities including interfaith dialogue, community dialogues, and teen mentoring programs, sports initiatives, and dialogues for those who will chart our future, our next generation. Too many youth are exposed to a level of violence equivalent to that of a war zone. While the young person may not have been physically struck, we know that the brains of young people are permanently damaged by exposure to violence. We can all engage on behalf of our younger generation, work together to do a better job supporting victims of crime, particularly child victims of trauma, and look for opportunities to mentor those in need of inspiration. The smallest of acts and the simplest of engagements can be truly life-changing. And I share with our folks all the time that for the couple of seconds it takes to just step step out of a car and reach out and shake hands with a young kid and wear in a uniform in particular what an impact that may make on that kid and ask them how they're doing, how's things going, because maybe nobody in their life has asked them that in the last six months, in the last year, or maybe ever. So to take that, that time that doesn't cost us a dime, 
but is invaluable down the road. We need to do more of that. I'm working with DA Jackie Lacey, federal, state, and community partners to develop diversion strategies to reduce the number of mentally ill individuals in our jail. Sadly, we're the largest mental health hospital in the country. But jail is not simply a place to treat those who can remain in the community and simply deteriorate in our jails. We've got that backwards. Too often, mental illness, homelessness, and poverty serve as a pathway into our justice system, and we need to work together to change that paradigm. Law enforcement needs to strengthen communities so that they are and feel safe. We must realize that our responsibility does not end when the yellow tape comes down. We can best succeed when we take to heart the need to police with and not simply in our communities. Moving forward, I'm well aware of the value of working close with our closely with our legal profession and taking advantage of the expertise and experience that all of you have to offer. In law enforcement, we depend on community relationships to help identify and reduce crime. You are often the best source of emerging criminal trends, and you can help us as we seek to strengthen public trust. We all benefit as individuals and as employers and employees seeking to promote a stronger economy when our communities are safer. Just as we all benefit as individuals and as participants in the legal system when our justice system oper operates fairly and effectively. Thank you for allowing me the time here to be able to share some thoughts with you and for listening. As you can see, the issues we're facing are immense, just as the opportunities are equally large. Many eyes are on us because of our own recent challenges in the Sheriff's Department and what's going on nationwide in policing. But also because, as so often the case, as California goes, so goes the country. And I intend to see us succeed and meet the challenges before us head on. Thank you all very much for your partnership, for your leadership in our community, and I look forward to working with you as we move forward. Thank you very much. So I run a tight ship. It's 105. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate our scholarship award recipients and our rule of law writing competition award recipients. We hope to see you often, and we hope to see good things come from the rest of your careers. And thank you for coming, and thank you for participating. I want to thank the court for coming every year. It means a great deal to us, and we are committed to the independence of the judiciary and to make sure that it need, get, gets what it needs and we will continue to go up to Sacramento and do what we need to do. Thank you to the court for coming. Congratulations to Justice Baxter on his retirement. Thank you, Sheriff McDonald, for your good words. Thank you, Ron, for coming and making us proud. Um, and thank you all for a very lovely afternoon. We hope to see you again at the 67th Annual Scholarship Luncheon. I don't want to forget to thank our councilman, Willie Bryan, for being here. And I'm going to remind everyone, if you would all please stay seated until all the justices have exited the room so that they can get down to their court calendar this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>